dear commissioner, dear colleagues, dear all. Thank you for joining us and taking part in this interest in um, quality renew event. I am very proud of belonging to the group who is leading the fight against disinformation at the European Parliament. History has proved that lies and manipulation of information have been part of power relation and the struggle between states. Disinformation is not a new phenomenon, but the medium used to spread it, the internet, is something new. The industrial production of lies to undermine confidence in political pluralism has been renovated. We must defend in the parliament the democratic rule of law. Minister Tupurainen said in a debate here in this house that the rule of law needs constant care and protection. Otherwise, the forest will grow back. She called for a militant democracy. I fully agree. I think that a way to protect democracy in the 21st century is to protect social networks from disinformation. To spread disinformation and lies are ahead of us. We need to regulate objectively and quickly various issues because this is a high risk threat that continues to mutate. In several cases, it develops serious kinds of cyber crimes with economic objective or undermine our strategic capacities or the essence of political pluralism. COVID-19 has caused unprecedented levels of health concerns across the globe and has led to a parallel pandemic of disinformation. We call it quite rightly infodemic. Renew thinks that it is necessary to reflect on it. COVID-19 has shown how easily people can be manipulated and the serious consequences that it has for people as individuals and for society as a whole. COVID-19 has shown that this information has an external dimension, but there are aspects of the phenomenon that affect the rights and freedoms of European citizens and therefore the rule of law in member states. It is necessary to address the, the legal gaps in the internet and reflect on the role that individuals, organizations, online platforms and public authorities should have in the fight against disinformation. We assume that intensive use of networks generates enormous economic returns and influence and even algorithms can be addictive to the use of the internet. And so, preformats and addict citizens are vulnerable to disinformation strategies. A debate with the business sector is necessary, always. Today, we will address the most relevant issues and answer the main questions through three panels. Is there a true infodemic? How should we respond? How should we react towards the countries that organize anti-EU campaigns? During the pandemic, the time of greatest vulnerability was before the European Commission and Parliament took the lead in policy and communication. We know this. When we lead and provide solutions, destructive strategies have fewer places to enter. We hope that this in that political discussion at European level, ahead of the presentation of the European Commission communication on disinformation in the context of COVID-19, can contribute to define a much needed and proper European strategy on disinformation. When we design resiliency, Mm. We think on education, and humble, my, my humble opinion, when I think of public policy and education, I, I think of 
Condorcet and Juillard. The school is the main battleground in defense of civilization. Condorcet, after the French Revolution, had no doubts. People needed power and instruction. Public policies on education to be more educated and freer. This is the challenge of the 21st century in times of social networks and other revolution. We need education to improve civilization, to avoid manipulation and sectarian polarization that only leads to hateful speech and the destruction of the most precious thing in the core of the democratic rule of law. The ideological pluralism that the majority cultivates and desires. The other, the sectarianism, dogmatism embraced by the majority would destroy democracy from within. Uh, and now, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Ms. Jurova, Vice President of the European Commission for Values and Transparency. Ms. Jurova, thank you for accepting our invitation to this first renew webinar on this information. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Th thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to this online webinar on such a timely and important topic. And I cannot agree more with everything what, what Madame might have said, because uh, this was a very, very clear uh, uh, and alarming description of, of the phenomenon of, of disinformation, not only in Corona times, but, but uh, in the times to, to come, uh, which needs some action from, from our side, which needs the European response. I, I will try to... <clears throat> present to you what we have done, what we are doing, and what we plan to do still, still in this year. And I will try to be as concrete as possible. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, pandemic is accompanied uh, by infodemic, which is the, the term uh, uh, presented by the World Health Organization. And uh, I am sure that uh, <clears throat> this is also something uh, the, the pandemic accompanied by infodemic which uh, requires uh, uh, our ability to take the lesson and to to use the the new expertise and new knowledge on how such infodemic can work and how uh, big the manipulative uh, and destructive uh, potential uh, can be on, on our society. I am sure that you took note of uh, <clears throat> the Twitter actions to take some tweets of President Trump as fact-checked uh, or violating uh, the policy of the platforms by statements inciting to violence. While this argument is now uh, next to, to other many things happening in the US, Twitter, Facebook and other platforms are global and relevant for politicians and users in Europe as much as they are in the United States. And I have been saying for a long time uh, that I want platforms to become more responsible. Therefore, I support Twitter's action to implement transparent and consistent moderation policy. This is not about censorship. Everyone can still see the tweets, but it is about having some limits and taking some responsibility of what is happening in the digital world. And obviously, this has triggered an avalanche of re reactions in the United States and calls from the president to revise the US liability rules. Luckily, back in Europe, we are far ahead in this debate. We are not only talking, we are acting. Next week, uh, as you already heard, uh, you will see a teaser with a communication on disinformation in the COVID context. And by the end of the year, we will come with the Digital Services Act and with the European Democracy Action Plan. Uh, and uh, thus, uh, we will come with the regulatory ideas on how to advance this debate about disinformation and uh, increased online responsibility. The COVID-19 pandemic is just a reminder about the huge problem of misinformation, disinformation and digital hoaxes. 
This can create confusion, this creates distrust, and it uh, can undermine an effective public health response. We have seen scammers trying to make money to people's schools, but we have also seen a system Commissioner, I believe your uh, voice has been muted by accident. Yes, because now I'm going to speak about a uh, very serious thing. So somebody has uh, <laughs> silenced me. No, <laughs> no, I, back now. I, I, I did it uh, on my own here. So I still have it under control to, to the ability to speak. <laughs> No, but I, I, I wanted to say that we have also seen a systemic attack on Europe and our member states promoted, for instance, by pro-Kremlin media about how badly we are dealing with the crisis or even that the virus was spread by NATO or that 5G masks are helping to spread the virus. Hence, uh, it is no exaggeration to say that proper information especially in these times, can save lives. And this is also a reminder for us that there is a plenty of bad actors that want to exploit the crisis for economic or political gains. They want to devise us, sow division, instill fear, and even put lives at risk. And once again, online platforms are used as main tools for disinformation and consumer hoaxes. So let me first tell you about some actions we have taken so far and about plans what I would like to do in the future. We acted quite quickly already on the 3rd of March. I held the first meeting with the social media platforms. We agreed they would promote links to WHO and health authorities and remove ads that offer fake medicines or inflate prices for normal products. They also removed millions of pieces of content that is potentially harmful, like, for instance, advice to drink bleach to kill corona. And I welcome those quick measures taken by the platforms. I support the approach that focuses on facilitating access to authoritative sources tackling harmful content and systemic, systemic takedown of exploitative or misleading ads, while at the same time preserving the freedom of expression and freedom of information. These quick measures were possible because in Europe we have not started from scratch. Thanks to the code of practice on disinformation, which we adopted already uh, uh, before the European elections, if you remember, uh, both platforms and authorities have developed tools that could be quickly deployed also in this crisis. We also used the rapid alert system to exchange information with member states and created the commission in the commission an information hub about COVID-19, including exposing false stories. But of course, the job is not done. Far from it. The crisis showed us again that other state actors have powerful propaganda machines. I remember being shocked when I saw the opinion poll in Italy showing that Italians thought of China much more as a friend and Germany as an enemy. I would have never believed this might happen. One reason for this is that in the European Union, we take helping each other for granted. Another, that our member states too easily roll out the red carpet and communicate about dubious help from outside while forgetting to apply the same standards about the EU. So this is what we are doing with the platforms, uh, but uh, they cannot be the only ones to do uh, concrete, concrete work. Uh, we have to support member state authorities and improve cooperation among them in the EU. We need to beef up our cooperation with international partners, including uh, NATO. Uh, we must not forget that this information is, is uh, part of uh, the hybrid threats. So this is a security issue as well. 
we need to engage more civil society and last but not least uh, we need to support free and independent media resilient and critical citizens to sum up we all need to get better in detecting analyzing and exposing this information we must respond to this crisis in our european way in full respect of our fundamental principles and values as set out in the treaties i want to stress in particular the freedom of speech and free uh, media freedom we need journalism employing professional standards to provide reliable and accurate information and to scrutinize the measures taken in response to the global health threat and we need to let journalists do their work freely. This crisis showed us once again that social media are not a replacement for quality journalism. I also think that the need for experts information has increased significantly, which is a welcome shift. I think the public is not tired of experts and we have to find a way to make their voices heard. Uh, this uh, COVID era or this situation is also bringing one, one lesson and, and proves what, what I thought already before, that the sectors which are affected by disinformation, which are under the attack, has to be much more proactive to defend their trustworthy and reliable information. Before the crisis, I, I uh, had a survey on my table that what is most affected by disinformation it's migration it's environment it's minorities and also it's health it was already health sector because uh, the, there was a lot of conspiracy theories about vaccination and of course uh, what was also affected was the time before elections and Already before, before the crisis, it was quite clear that the sectors have to be much more proactive and they have to, I, I will use the word, defend the, their truth. And uh, when, when COVID came, uh, we had a very good uh, agreement with Stella uh, Stylianides uh, because uh, she is our health uh, uh, commissioner uh, who understood very well that my role is open the space or agree on the on the opening the space in on the platforms for authoritative uh, content but the health sector has to deliver such content and update and use lege artist uh, information and uh, to be really trusted and to 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 gain and deserve the trust from from the from the society and I think that we are, we are achieving results on that. Uh, so coming back, uh, the communication uh, which you will see next week will take stock of the situation and of the actions taken so far to limit the impact of COVID-19 related disinformation and propose complementary actions to further protect European citizens from dangerous disinformation campaigns. It will also consider how the flow of reliable information can be strengthened within the EU and from outside. The, the communication will also address the need for more strategic communication. Far too often we did not manage to get our story about Europe, European Union support out, not in member states nor in neighboring countries. And it is high time to step up on this and not to allow others, such as China, to occupy the space. No more propaganda around the boxes with China with love, which we saw, which we saw in the, in the peak of COVID. Uh, we are grateful for the support. We bought a lot of necessary equipment from China but uh, we have also to say the truth about who is helping how, and there was a lot of solidarity and help among the member states, which was not communicated properly. And we have to strengthen this strategic communication. The communication uh, we will publish next, next week will also include reflection on how to improve support for competent authorities, fact checkers and researchers, also with the help of the newly created European Digital Media Observatory. And we need to get better in assessing the threats and connect it, 
connecting with partners such as NATO on this. I have already mentioned it before. And we will have clear expectations from platforms to become more transparent and to remove financial incentives to spread disinformation. We have many different surveys showing that lying flies quicker and sells better. This has to be stopped or minimized. And there are many other surprising things. Uh, we will deal with uh, the impact of disinformation on elections uh, in the European Democracy Action Plan. I'm really going to focus on, on the phenomenon that uh, which we saw that uh, the politicians who are in a campaign and who, li who lie, they do not pay any price and they are winning elections. And I, I think that this is something we have to look into. Without any censorship and without any draconic regulatory actions. We need to ensure transparency and accountability. Citizens need to know how information is reaching them and where it comes from. And we need to invest in a society that is media savvy and critical. Media literacy and digital skills need to improve to ensure a more resilient society. You know that now around the budget, we speak about the digital tax. I am deeply convinced we need such a tax and we need at least part of this tax, the money collected from the digital sector to be invested in education and to be invested in, in uh, the awareness raising. We do not have resilient enough society at this moment. It's bad to produce lies, but it's also bad that so many people have a tendency to believe the lies. And we, we need to find some, some proper balance. As I said before, we are not starting from scratch. Our debate is quite advanced. Now we are launching the consultation process for the Digital Services Act. Uh, and uh, it, we will work in two parallel tracks, the Digital Services Act and uh, the digital and the European Democracy Action Plan will be uh, finished uh, uh, in the in the same period in at the end of this year. And I trust that Renew will be helping and will be supporting and also will be critical about what we are doing and what we are planning. This is not a trivial uh, trivial topic. We want the digital sphere and digital uh, uh, tools to develop and to be helpful and to contribute to education and, and better communication. We are harvesting that now in the COVID period. So let's, let's not uh, blame uh, the, the digital platforms for, for everything and, and the, the digital tools as such for, for all, all our problems. But we also have to find a way how to uh, minimize the, the negative things uh, and dangerous things. And this is a very sensitive topic. Uh, we need to find the right balance. There is no precedent. European Union is far ahead. And uh, I think that as well as what we did uh, in, in data protection and, and privacy protection, we were the first ones who said, stop it. The individual citizen has to be in the center of our efforts to, to keep his freedom and his privacy. I think also on tackling the illegal and harmful content online will uh, be uh, the uh, Europe will be probably the, the first one which will try to find the balanced uh, systematic solution. So I trust Renew will help us. Uh, I am fully at the disposal of everybody who would like to comment on that and advice. Uh, we will be collecting a lot of inspirations and expert opinions uh, by uh, the at least the, the mid of, of this year when we will consult. And uh, I, I mean uh, before the European De Democracy Action Plan especially. And uh, I am sure that uh, we will come to, to a good result. Uh, and uh, the promising thing is that 
we are really tackling with something with a problem which which matters which is influencing everyday life of people and which requires action and, and smart solution thank you very much yeah can you hear me yes oh dear vice president thank you um, I would like to thank you for your answer and your contribution in general. And we have no time, unfortunately, for questions. And I, I would like to introduce Miss um, Natalie Luasso, who will moderate our first panel. And um, um, I do not want to miss the opportunity to thank you, the Renew team and my team in particular, the hard work done to organize the webinar. Ms. Loiseau, um, it's your time. Thank you, Marita Palgaza. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Vera Jourova, for uh, your inspiring uh, words. Um, we will start uh, this uh, first panel, and I would first of all like to uh, introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, starting with uh, Javier Lesaca, he's a visiting scholar at Columbia University and an associate professor at the Faculty of Communication at University of Navarra in Spain. His research specializes in communication strategies of terrorist groups, but also in Russian disinformation uh, strategies targeting Europe. Uh, we also have with us Jose Miguel Cansado, he's a partner at Alto Data Analytics and the, other, the author of several books, including a fiction book who's named Digital Renaissance, and of course I like it. Um, we have with us uh, Rudi Reichstadt. Uh, he's the founder and director of Conspiracy Watch, a website specialized in analyzing conspiracy theories and disinformation. And last but not least, Patrick Pennings is the head of the Information Society Department of the Council of Europe, and he has worked on threats that new technologies may bring to democratic institutions. Um, before giving them the floor, uh, I would like to remind MEPs following this panel to ask questions using their Zoom chat box for all other guests Please use the Q&A section of the web stream platform, which you are using to follow us. I will be the moderator, but most of all the timekeeper of this panel. So now I give the floor for five minutes sharp to Javier Lesaca. Can you please tell us how you view origins and methods of disinformation and malicious content in this very special context of COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gosso. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President. Thank you to very good friend, to very good friends that I see here in the chat, like Maite and uh, Josemi. Uh, didn't know. I mean, it's a, it's a pleasure to meet, to chat with you this night for me, this <laughs> morning for you. Uh, and I think the panel is, is uh, I mean, it's really hard to find like a more uh, uh, a combination of, of good experts and. People like no, no, no about the field. Um, I mean, I'm gonna go straight to. Um, I'm gonna share a small presentation here. Um, please confirm that you can. Uh, please confirm that you can see a presentation. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'm gonna go straight to your to your uh, question to, um, about the about the methodology of this information. Okay. So. Um, from my experiences uh, in analyzing several um, contexts and fields of uh, communication disruption campaigns and disinformation, um, I think there is a very, a very clear um, methodology of disinformation uh, that fits in every single uh, disinformation campaign all around the world. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, and it's, this disinformation campaign is based on the, I mean, the agent of disinformation, what really does is first they make an analysis on, on the vulnerabilities of the adversary, of their <coughs> state institution they want to destabilize. Then they create a series of uh, tra transmedia narratives in order to foster and to add fuel to that, to the uh, pre-existing vulnerabilities that the adversary has. 
then this this narrative uh it's hello can someone mute his or her okay. because there is echo thank you this narrative um it's uh, transmitted in a net of all media so uh, i mean the, the agent of this information they don't rely on traditional media they know that it's possible to create a net a net of all media that uh, most of, uh, I mean, of a uh, very significant part of public opinion is not going to differentiate from traditional media. And then the last part is the, is the automatized use of social media in order to, to, to distribute with magnitude this, this kind of narratives, okay? So basically this information is linked to the, to the uh, analysis of pre-existing vulnerabilities of a country. Can you think in a better in a, or in a bigger vulnerability for a country or for a region or for an institution like the European Union that the COVID-19 is really hard? I mean, because it has uh, all elements. I mean, it has the element that the citizens might not trust anymore in public institutions, in, in, in health system, in traditional media, in the economy. So, I mean, this, this pandemic has all the, all the elements of being like a, a very clear vulnerability that might be exploded by, by, by agents of this information. Uh, basically, now I'm conducting a research analyzing since February 1st till the end of May. Uh, um, I'm following a series, um, a, uh, a net of 75 potential misinformation digital platforms all around the world uh, that I gather around 4,000 potential malicious narratives regarding the, the COVID-19. Basically, the main narratives regarding the COVID-19 uh, pandemia uh, or the COVID-19 vulnerability are uh, the feeling against uh, America, United States, uh, fostering the feelings against globalism, fostering uh, or challenging the, the, the state of alarms or the, the measures that uh, governments have applied in order to, um, to flat the curve of the, of the, of the, pande of the pandemic, the, the feeling against the European Union, uh, I mean, all the narratives uh, that are related to pseudoscience or, I mean, non-science, uh, non I mean, anti-vaccines movements, uh, non-tradition, I mean, non-scientific non method, methods to, 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 uh, to treat the, the illness and feelings against China. So basically, these six are the main six narratives regarding the, uh, the coronavirus. But what I really want to make, uh, because you asked me who is behind all this, uh, I mean, I, <laughs> that's, <laughs> I don't have a silver bite question to that. I mean, then, then I think we are going to enter in the, in the field of attribution, and that's the, the hardest part of all this debate. But I'm going to show you some examples, and I think by showing you some examples, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill two, two objectives. First of all, I'm going to answer your question by uh, so in examples, so I don't want I don't want to be the judge here. I mean, we are going to all, all of us. We are going to be able to to see what's going on. And second, I think we can foster a debate with examples. I'm going to show you. Okay. So basically, um, I don't. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here you have like some of the first uh, anti-European messages that were um, that 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 I, I started to observe at the beginning of Mar uh, I mean March April um, in. Uh, uh, regarding the European Union, I mean, regarding the, the, the COVID-19 and the anti-European Union movements. And it's very interesting how to see, like, for example, like webs like Strategic Culture, which is based in, uh, in Moscow and it has a very programming uh, narrative. Um, although we, it's, it's kind of a hidden media because we don't know who is really behind this media. There is, it doesn't offer a real uh, uh, address. Uh, it's not, they don't offer like a, a current email where you can uh, provide like a conversation with them. So they started to put these kind of messages, the Troika horse, uh, EU Corona package, but puts Italy and Southern Europe under economic seats. And then the same very day, a web, uh, a digital platform also hiding, I mean, that they don't provide any information who is behind it, uh, the, the, all the articles are without any signature, uh, and that it's based in the United States and it's related with the alt-right in the United States, they started to replicate the same content at the same time and fostering like the Italexit movement. This was not a chance. Uh, basically, uh, the next week, uh, it was an article publishing the same digital platform saying Merkel sur sur survives the corona, the corona apocalypse by the European Union want. Uh, the same very day, again, Europe reloaded and alt-right media based in the United States and other, uh, so another, another very similar media outlets like uh, uh, Variety Weekly, The Patriot Times, published the same very content at the same time. Uh, 
it was, I mean, this is not a chance. This is a, a, a role, this is a model that we can see uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, the digital platforms are not working on their own, but they are working on, uh, the, sorry, the potential malicious digital platforms are working on net, are working like, uh, is, we have the evidence that there is kind of net of coordination between different platforms in different countries, fostering the same narratives that are fostering at the same time, the vulnerability of the pandemic, uh, not only in Europe, but all around the world. So for example, uh, in March 1st, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, we saw like, an article published by Global Research, which is a media outlet in Canada, which very pro-Russian narrative, uh, saying that who is behind the false pandemic, uh, then uh, this, uh, once again, this alt-right media, United States, Europe reloaded, uh, uh, like distributed the same messages. And finally, uh, two days uh, after, after that, it was, I mean, the message impact in several um, le left and right radical websites in Spanish, for example, like Caos en la Red, Verdad y Paciencia, and Muelas Gaitán. In, I mean, the same content in Spanish. Uh, we see the same like another article who created the virus uh, was it the united states or china again it was a strategic culture the first who, who published this article in in march 5 5th and then we see how for global research this website in canada the owns which is an alt-right media in united states alt world another alt-right media contra information in italia and then finally press tv an iranian website and at the same time hispan tv which is the the, the, the spanish uh, language uh, uh, Iranian channel published the same content in, Sp in Spain that was replied with the uh, in a in a far far left website in Spanish and in a far left website in Latin America. And finally, the last example. I mean, all this crazy theory about the 5G and the uh, the relationship with the, with the COVID-19. I and mean, one of the first media published this uh, this conspiracy theory was Henry Macau, an anti-systemic website in Canada. The content was published in an alt-right and anti-Semitic website in the United States, which is called What, what Does It Mean? And it has a, a direct impact in, in the alt-right community in Spain and the conspiracy theory, uh, theory in, uh, in Spain. And it was also uh, replied or multiplied by an article published in Spanish uh, by Sputnik, in, uh, which is a, a Russia, a, a, a Russia um, media outlet. Uh, basically, what, what I want to show you with these examples um, is that uh, we don't only have the evidence that the vulnerability of the COVID-19 is being used in order to, uh, to erode the trust of European citizens in their public institutions, but there is also the evidence that a very uh, a net of, uh, of media outlets in different non-European countries with very similar characteristics. Basically, they don't provide information about who is behind these media, these media outlets. All these media outlets are, are, have been created in the last five years, more or less, so they don't have a lot of history. And they are basically sharing the same narratives that are fostering this, uh, this, this information content. So this is the evidence of what's going on right now. I don't know if uh, Nathalie Lusso I, I replied to your answer, but uh, I hope yes. that at least I have uh, provided some step for the debate. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. I'm sure there will be uh, questions afterwards, so we'll try to keep time for questions. Thank you, Javier Lesaca. Now I give the floor to Jose Miguel Gonzado. Uh, you've been working on health-related social network disinformation. Can you tell us how you measure it? Um, can you also tell us um, what is the responsibility of platforms and how should they be handled? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rousseau, and thank you for, for the invitation to this, uh, to this, this event. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to, to share uh, our findings with you. What we, we're going to show you is, um, we want to illustrate the way this information can be measured. Right? We, we use big data analysis because one of the things that we, we've seen, this information is not something new, this information or propaganda, but now it's the, the digital sphere is a phenomenon tool for people to spread this information. The good side of it is that we can measure that. We can measure the, the impact. So I'll show you just one quick example. And this I thing is, uh, what we're going to show is how anti-vaxxers, I mean, this is the uh, mapping anti-vaxxers anti movement before COVID, right? So 
after COVID, this has exploded, right? But I just want to, to give the view of how it was before COVID, because that can give us a view of the seed of how these things, they have a seed, they have an underground seed, and then when something like COVID happens, it, it explodes. The first, so just a quick one, just to show that, for instance, we can, in this type of, uh, of graph, we're showing all, well, millions of comments around vaccines, right? We, we group them using big data to make sure that we know which stems are used the most and how they cluster together. So what this is already telling us is, okay, there is some people, some potent narratives around, again, uh, on, of anti-vaxxers, but it's true that in, in the digital space, there's also a lot of campaigns and groups with vaccines work trying to counter that, that thing. So that's something that it's already happening, right? Clearly, um, and this is where transmedia, as Javier mentioned, plays a key, a key role. Uh, things like films like Vax is one of the, um, the, the films that there is a business case even for that for that film, which is called Piracy Survey. This is a film that says that there is a cover up for CDC to actually, um, and so that they don't tell us that vaccines cause uh, uh, MMR and autism, right? Based on some fake. Uh, research, right? Well, this is one of the, the, the movies that inspired most of the movement, or I refer uh, and give uh, some fuel to, to the, to the anti-vax uh, anti movement. That, that gives us a picture of, okay, well, this was the discussion around anti-vaxxers before. Now, what we're going to do is, okay, we want to map who are talking about vaccines. I mean, really, is this reaching Everyone is reaching just a number of people. So here what we do is we map communities so we are able to understand who are the most influential actors in, 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 in the debate around vaccines, but also how they link together, how they cluster together. That, that is a very powerful tool. That, so once we have clustered the people, we know who is influential on which audiences, right? And well, this, this will tell us that well, there's people talking about vaccines, the different communities, the different colors are showing just different people talking about different things. Uh, the, here we have, WHO, we have, we have big pharma comp pharmaceutical companies uh, talking about the vaccines, some campaigns. But here there is a group, which is this one that you can tell is, is separated from the rest. This is most of the people are actually talking in favor of vaccines, right? What this is telling you, this group here that is separated, these are the guys that are being misinformed or that are actually misinforming and are uh, uh, disinforming around vaccines, right? This is the group of anti-vaxxers. This is telling us also the magnitude of how many people is, is, is there. But the, the graph also tell us how these guys are disconnected, right? From the reality. One of the things that we see uh, disinforming actors doing all, all the time is uh, disconnecting their, uh, their targets from mainstream media, from mainstream conversations, right? They want to tell you mainstream media, lies, they don't tell you the truth, we are the ones telling you the truth. And then once they disconnect you, uh, then that uh, impairs your critical thinking, right? Because one, once you don't trust, you can, they tell you you don't not to trust mainstream media, of course, you, you're, if you believe them, you can only trust them, right? Then these are the guys that, that will tell you that the lie. When we look about, okay, let's see who is more, uh, where we find up normal users in terms of activity, right? Who is more active in, in, this, in this, well, no surprise, right? All the active users, when, once we measure abnormal high activity users, we see that all of them are in the cluster of anti-vaxxers, right? Anti-vaxxer is a conspiracy series, and this is an example, sells more. I mean, and people doing that are more active, they spread it, they're mobilized, they think they are on a cause to actually uh, discover a new reality to people, and they're extremely more active. The good news is that, well, this is, they're disconnected, right? But on the people that they connect with, they really have a big impact, right? And they create that alternative reality, which is very difficult to counter because these people are not impacted by all the campaigns that uh, uh, vaccines works. In fact, they even reframe that to say, you know, why does do pharmaceutical companies spend so much trying to convince us that vaccines are good. Well, that's a sign that the, probably there is something wrong with it, right? So even they will reframe that to, to, the, to the causes. There is a business case for this, that the problem is conspiracy theories uh, uh, also sell. So a, apart from potential uh, state actors that might want to ha have a, po a political agenda, might use um, and use this information and propaganda for the political ends or for, the, for their own agenda, the reality is that conspiracy theories sell more. If, if we analyze advertising uh, campaigns in, in, in around vaccines, you can see that, in fact, the, the, the anti-vaxxers are as uh, uh, 
strategic in their campaigns as the pro-vaxxers are, right? So they buy advertising, they target on, on particularly on female population in fertile age, because they know that, those, that that's the population thinking about, uh, uh, about vaccination. And why would anyone invest in this? Well, because you have all these type of alternative media that actually end up selling advertising, uh, receiving donations because they, they, uh, they get you on a cost, right? So if you want to create a media around vaccines and you want to make some money, you want to, well, you know, if you make an alternative media that will sell more than a media telling you the reality, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it works like, like that, right? And that's a real danger. When we look at, okay, what, what are the arguments that, uh, and again, this is pre, uh, previous to COVID, right? But just to illustrate what they say, what vaccines causes autism, big pharma just wants to make massive profits from vaccines. Uh, everyone has the right to decide. So why should they tell us if we have to be va vaccinated? Uh, children receive too many vaccines. Let me summarize this. Um, uh, all those arguments fall into kind of three categories. On one of them is fake science. In other aspects, it's fake news, right? So in other topics, we have fake news. We have even fake history. We know that for some separatist nationalist reason, they create an alternative history so that the people believe this is fake science in this case, right? So they create pure lies, like uh, vaccines cause autism. They, they create some reports which are false, uh, which are scientifically false, right? They say, this is not true. This is not confirmed. But of course, I'm going to tell you that big pharma influence clinical trials and, and so on. And then they start to go into conspiracy theories, right? This is always an element that, that plays yeah, in these uh, in this information campaigns. You know, it's a, the deepest stake. They don't want you to know this, but we're telling you, this is their hidden agenda logic, right? You find someone which has a likely uh, hidden agenda, and then you go with, with it. And, the, and the, the, the complex part about this is that some of these messages might not be totally uh, wrong, but framing within this, they create a, an element for conspiracy theory. That's why this information is such a, is such a, a complex topic, right? Like for example, pharmaceutical companies, probably they make some money, some profits from vaccines, right? Probably even if you put that, that might be important, but that doesn't mean that they do it because of profits, right? Or that doesn't mean that that, that, that makes uh, vaccines being, being bad. And then, of course, you always have another appeal to higher values, like freedom and so on, which again, it could be absolutely right, right to decide whether you, uh, yes, you have to, of course, that, that's, that's true. But once you frame into this, this make a cocktail so that you get audiences to actually believe on fake science, right? So because these two elements might have certain, what well, they could be run, well, well that, that make you believe. We're not just into, into this. So to finalize, I um, just wanted to give that, that glimpse. And I think you've, you've already mentioned that the uh, uh, president uh, Europe also mentioned, mentioned it, right? I mean, the, what it, uh, and, 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 and MEP uh, Maite and Ms. Pagasundua also, also mentioned it, right? Uh, at the end, the issue is uh, distrust, right? I mean, uh, and this is uh, like a vicious cycle, right? Anyone disinforming is going to create mistrust in, this, in institutions, in media. And of course, the more mistrust in media institutions, the more likely you have a nurture, you're nurturing an environment for, for alternative media and alternative facts to world. So that's why it's so important that institutions, media in particular, we gain back the, the trust in them. The, pe the people can really trust in, main in mainstream media. And this is difficult because of the business model. And this is a difficult reality because it's easier to say than to do. Because today, uh, um, mainstream media are fighting uh, for attention, right? The business model is based on attention. And, you know, the journalists say that don't let uh, the truth ruin one, of, one um, headline, right? Uh, so uh, it, it's unfortunate, but it's something that we need to deal with. And this is where, uh, uh, for instance, I think policymakers, leaders, you have a key role to protect uh, the, the, the trust in institutions, because once this is eroded, uh, well, it, it's, it's the consequences, in my view, is we have things like this, right? I mean, I mean, now people, they don't know what is right and what is true, right? And this is pre-COVID. COVID is actually, has blown this. I mean, you have the, the 5G story that I have friends which are, I have a telecom engineering background, I have friends telecom engineering from, telecom engineering from the university telling me, well, you've seen this report, it, it might, I mean, it's, it's all science is telling you that 5G is, is, is harmless. I mean, there are science, there's deep studies about this. People with engineering background will tell you now that some of them have doubts, right? So, and what is at stake to finalize? 
I'll, I'll end up with, with this uh, quote from, from Hannah Haren, right, from the origins of totalitarianism in, in 1951. She said, the ideal subject for totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people whom to, for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, the distinction between true and false, no longer exists. The problem is, is the rule of law, is democracies which are at, at the stake. Once people don't know what to believe, uh, is where a, an authoritarian leader is needed, right? We need someone with a clear idea because, you know, to put things in order. And this is really a danger. And I think this is why institutions, we, we, we must, we have, I think you do have a duty to protect the society from that, right? So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Miguel Cansado. It leads me directly to our next speaker, uh, Rudi Reichstadt. You've been vocal in underlying the role of conspiracy theories in attacking liberal democracies. So yes. please tell us, do you think COVID-19 disinformation has a political dimension? Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak. Uh, I will try to be as short as possible, I swear. Uh, so first, the political dimension of disinformation about uh, COVID-19. Uh, it seems uh, obvious uh, to give you a quick overview. Uh, I would say that uh, we have seen since January uh, the appearance of conspiracy, conspiratorial uh, comments, uh, from uh, anonymous internet users uh, or, at the contrary, from uh, well-identified uh, activists and uh, media uh, outlets. Uh, you know, uh, these uh, conspiracy theories, uh, Javier Lesaka uh, just spoke uh, uh, about them. Uh, what, uh, what they say? They said uh, that the coronavirus was a man-made uh, virus, that it was a biological weapon, that the, pandem that the pandemic uh, was linked to the deployment of uh, uh, the 5G uh, network, uh, that the final goal of this uh, pandemic uh, is actually to kill millions of people uh, in order to, to reduce the uh, world's population, uh, that uh, uh, it is a pretext uh, for future uh, uh, obligatory uh, uh, vaccination campaign, uh, 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 whose real goal uh, is to put a microchip implant uh, under our skin uh, without any consent uh, from us. Uh, Jose Miguel Cansado uh, just made a, a brilliant intervention uh, about that, about uh, anti-vaxxers uh, uh, especially. Uh, they said that the pandemic is uh, in the financial interest of Big Pharma uh, and uh, that it is a conspiracy by the CIA, by Bill Gates, by George Soros, the Jews, the State of Israel, the Pasteur Institute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, these comments uh, immediately add a political dimension. Uh, you must understand that to develop and flourish, uh, conspiracy theories need, need to fit into a pre-existing narrative, a conspiracy myth uh, already there uh, that will take over the new conspiracy theory, feed it, and make it grow. Um, so they, may, they came, uh, these uh, conspiracy theories, largely from the most extremist uh, fringes of uh, our democracies, uh, far right, uh, especially, uh, populist parties such as uh, the Rassemblement National uh, in France, uh, echoed and accompanied uh, these uh, ideas. Uh, but these ideas have also been taken up publicly by Chinese diplomacy itself, uh, very recently yet, uh, from uh, uh, its uh, embassy in France, uh, by chief uh, of state like uh, the Venezuelan uh, president, uh, Nicolas Maduro, uh, by Russia's uh, uh, state-owned media outlets uh, like Russia Today uh, and Sputnik, um, and by, uh, notably by the Iranian uh, authorities and outlets uh, as well. And for, for a simple reason, uh, these uh, authoritarian governments uh, are trying to divert attention uh, from their own uh, management of the health crisis uh, to weaken the Western democracies and to silence any internal uh, protests. Uh, now, what uh, consequences uh, can this have for uh, democracy? I would say that the first 
obvious one is to undermine the confidence that people can have in their own democratic institutions, uh, in the world of the government, in the world of the health authorities, in the world of uh, scientists uh, and science uh, in general. We know that there is a statistical link between attachment to democracy and adherence to uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, we also know that there is a link between conspiracy theories and political extremism. Uh, in Germany, uh, we have seen for some uh, very worrying uh, convergences between uh, populist conspiracy theorists uh, and the extreme right-wing neo-Nazi uh, movement uh, in favor of uh, anti-lockdown uh, protests. Um, conspiracy theories are dangerous because they reinforce uh, racist and uh, anti-Semitic uh, prejudices. Uh, they are widely used to divide people and undermine what makes uh, our political communities, our nation, uh, democratic. That's why conspiracism is both a civic challenge and a challenge to representative liberal democracy. Uh, to finish, just uh, it's a civic challenge uh, uh, because when we no longer share the same common world, uh, just like an Aaron said, uh, democratic debates becomes uh, a dialogue of the diff. Uh, it's a democratic challenge because uh, uh, if you are told that elected officials are corrupt people and puppets uh, who are secretly paid by dark powers, then why fight for such a system? It is logical that if we are convinced that everything is corrupt, we should question and, and reject the system that, uh, that is responsible for the situation and the, the, so the, the, the liberal democracy. Uh, I would add uh, just uh, that uh, it is to a public health challenge. Uh, and just to finish one word, uh, if the, the European Union was able to respond vigorously to this problem, uh, to show uh, its ability to be respected and simply to protect people, uh, I tend to think uh, it would gain supporters and that this would help uh, to strengthen uh, pro-European pro sentiment. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, um, now, Patrick Pennings, you have specialized um, your work uh, on measuring the threats to human rights coming from disinformation. Can you tell us more about it? And can you tell us what you think should be Europe's reaction to these threats? Thank you. Thank you so much. When you have five minutes, either you speak very fast or you try to concentrate on a couple of things. So that's why I will concentrate primarily on why is this information a problem from a human rights perspective? And secondly, also what can be human rights responses to the disinformation? And I would like to start with what Javier Lesaca was referring to and which illustrates very well the report uh, that was written on weapons of mass destruction uh, of the park advisors that uh, produced this report, which is extremely interesting in this respect. Mass, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, just a quick reference that's on to something that we all have still in mind, where Trump inaccurately claimed mail-in ballots uh, are fraudulent and argued that mailboxes would be robbed. And for the first time, you have an internet service provider, Twitter, that um, decides to, to um, add a fact-checking note indicating that these statements were misleading. Uh, Commissioner Jurova uh, already referred to the responsibility of online networks. Now, why is this information a problem from a human rights perspective? First of all, this information with its potential to mislead and manipulate, manipulate to sow distrust. We've spoken about trust and distrust already. And confusion can affect a number of human rights. I will tackle them, not necessarily in order of, of priority, but just as they come along. The right of free and fair elections. For an election to be free and fair, voters need to have accurate information about the parties, candidates, and other factors. Incorrect information may influence the way the individual votes. And, and there are numerous reports which highlight the likely effects of disinformation on election results. The second is the right to reputation and other privacy considerations. 
Disinformation is often targeting specific individuals and their reputation, particularly political and public figures, as well as journalists. Uh, third, the right uh, to non-discrimination. Disinformation sometimes focuses on particular groups in society, especially vulnerable groups, refugees, migrants, ethnic minorities, intentionally or involuntarily inciting to violence, discrimination or hostility. The right to health, especially in the light of the pandemic, false information about health and disease prevention can lead to serious risks for people as we have set out in the previous interventions. And last but not least, the right to freedom of expression. Inappropriate, rash and too restrictive responses to disinformation pose risks to freedom of expression and media freedom. Any criminalization of information deemed false and can lead to censorship and suppression of dissident and dissent and critical thinking, especially as it gives the states the power to decide what is accurate and what is false. So we have to really be careful about it. We have already spoken about trust. Disinformation obviously brings distrust. And what is important in this slide is to see that no insti institution is really seen as both competent and ethical, where governments are not necessarily seen to be competent and are not necessarily seen to be ethical. It should also pose us a number of questions, especially when we are responding to uh, uh, an unprecedented crisis. So what are then these human rights compliant responses to disinformation which we should endorse? Um, the current state approaches to tackling disinformation often entrust an important task to, of deliberating what is true and what is false to online companies and to online platforms that are not necessarily qualified for this job. Some states have enacted specific legislation, but the human rights-based approach for, to disinformation generally addresses the adverse human rights impacts caused by disinformation rather than the disinformation itself. We believe that we should empower quality journalism, we should empower media and information literacy, literacy skills, we should promote online platforms transparency and human rights compliance and awareness over any response that manipulative capa capabilities of alg algorithms and artificial intelligence may have. So I will leave it at those few elements and leave it to the discussion. Thank you. Well, I would like really to thank our all distinguished speakers for uh, their uh, inspiring uh, intervention, a lot of information, a lot of food for thought. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of this panel, so we will not be able to take questions. And it's always frustrating both for speakers and for the audience. And I have to apologize, but really thank you all of you for helping us measuring the extent of this information and the consequences it has on our political systems and on human rights. Now, uh, I would like to uh, uh, give the floor to uh, the next uh, moderator for the next panel, my dear colleague Andre Kovaric for the second uh, panel, what response to the disinformation crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie, and uh, good morning to, uh, to everyone. Uh, I think uh, we uh, started with a with a very good interventions uh, in the, in the first panel, analyzing the the current situation and the infodemic crisis that uh, we are uh, currently facing. Um, without uh, any uh, further delays, I would like to introduce you uh, the second panel, which uh, based on the analysis that we were provided with in the first panel, the the, the panelists uh, now will concentrate more on uh, what can we actually do uh, in order to uh, tackle these information campaigns and what uh, uh, could be our uh, policy policy response on various levels of, of action when it comes to uh, the current the current situation. Let me present you uh, our panelist, uh, Anna Brakus, uh, journalist at uh, factograph.hr. 
uh, which is a Croatian fact-checking platform, uh, checking the factual accuracy of claims that are made in the public space. Uh, Dr. Maximilian Schubert, who is a president of Euroispa uh, and chair of cybersecurity committee uh, in the organization as well. Euroispa is the world's largest association of internet service providers, the ISPs, uh, representing over three, uh, 200, uh, 2,300 of them uh, across the Euro European Union and uh, EFTA countries. And last but not least, uh, uh, Madam Julian von Reppert Bismarck, who is a founder and CEO of, of uh, Lie Detectors, an organization offering literacy projects with the name of teaching critical thinking, helping children to, to understand news media and uh, make informed choices. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, we'll, we can definitely start with uh, the introductory remarks from our panelists. Five minutes each, please. And I would like to pass the floor to Anna Brakus to, to start the, our second panel. Anna, the floor is yours. Hi, hi. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I will try to be direct and short and keep it uh, around five minutes. So uh, I would like to talk to you about today uh, what we do at Factograph uh, and what we do in this region and why we feel uh, fact checking is important. So this information and misinformation creators uh, care about the borders between states only when they can be used to amplify the effects of mis and disinformation created. Otherwise, uh, much like the new coronavirus, their agenda doesn't stop at the borders. Uh, in our experience, misinformation creators, many of whom rely on the creation and the spread of misinformation for financial gain, feed off of nationalistic myths and stereotypes that exist in the countries of the SEE region. They use each other as boogeymen. So, that, plus the fact that our languages are so alike, only helps uh, the spread of misinformation. Uh, that's just one of the few reasons uh, why Factograph, along with fact checkers from Serbia, Slovenia, Montenegro, North Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, decided to form a fact checking network called C-Check. Uh, during this infodemic, we have uh, supported each other with sharing knowledge and information in order to combat a huge influx of harmful mis- and disinformation. Uh, but as I've said, uh, our efforts don't stop at the borders, even regional ones. Uh, that's why Factograph is a member of the Global Coronavirus Facts Alliance that was started at IFCN, the International Fact Checking Network, uh, which has published well over 6,000 fact checks uh, from publishers in 70 countries. Uh, IFCN has also created a searchable database for published fact checks and has recently invited uh, and published a call for research proposals uh, which could use that, that database uh, to, to uh, further our insights. Um, our team, which is a small team, <laughs> has been working around the clock and we have published uh, over 120 fact checks since February uh, that are directly related to uh, COVID-19 or, or the new coronavirus. Uh, we also created a separate blog, uh, which collects all of those published fact checks regarding COVID-19. So, so our readers can find everything that we've published on that topic uh, easily um, and whenever they want to do it. So uh, I would also like to say that we've noticed a huge surge in readership, uh, as, as well as readers contacting us uh, directly with requests uh, for fact checks with very specific topics and very specific questions. Uh, the bright side of that is that uh, the members of our newsroom feel uh, and we all see a, a, a positive effect uh, and we see the contribution that, that we make for the public good. Uh, our journalism is and of course will always be motivated uh, with public interest. Uh, however, uh, this surge in readership uh, also shows that People were, especially in March and April, uh, in dire need of reliable information. Uh, so the most popular and harmful disinformation cases uh, related to COVID-19 uh, in this region uh, differed as the months went, went by. Uh, 
uh, as we noted at the CCHEC roundtable that we organized at the beginning of May, uh, January and February were mostly related to conspiracy theories on the origin of the virus, um, like pseudoscience outbursts, uh, especially fake cures. Uh, in March, we noticed uh, shifts of attention to mostly denialist uh, narratives, such as is the pandemic real? Is the virus a hoax? Is the WHO uh, uh, lying as well as the government? Uh, is it all a cover up to implement 5G? And especially worrying, we noticed uh, a, a huge rise of healthcare professionals with uh, questionable scientific backgrounds uh, or no medical backgrounds at all, uh, producing and, and spreading this information. Um, I, I would like to use a, a, a term uh, from a report, report called Deep Fakes and Cheap Fakes, which was written by researchers Joan Donovan and Britt Paris. Uh, because we've noticed that most of the content that went viral in this region uh, were cheap fakes. That means images manipulated with cheap or no software at all, easily made with little knowledge of Photoshop or, or the like. Uh, that means that we've seen statements taken out of context uh, and video of interviews uh, or homemade videos um, with captions in Croatian or Serbian language uh, that was originally filmed in a variety of languages, such as English, German, French, Italian, or Russian. Um, we've also uh, noticed that uh, there's been a huge rise of threats and hatred uh, point, pointed to uh, Pakistan's journalists, uh, as well as fact checkers around the world. Um, th that's, of course, a very negative side effect uh, of, <laughs> of, of this situation. Uh, especially when we consider that in recent years, uh, Croatia's track record with media freedom is worrisome. Uh, the, the funding of nonprofit media is seriously lacking, uh, and uh, government media strategy is nowhere to be seen in years, uh, except in promises of the government, uh, that is. Um, I would also like to point out, point out that disinformation and misinformation and its negative effects uh, cannot be solved, in our opinion without taking the account uh, the levels of mistrust in political institutions the low and the low levels of media and civic literacy. Um, it also cannot be solved without taking into account that misinformation content is created in a way which is easily consumable, readily available, and shareable. Factual, science-based information often is not. Uh, Tech giants play a huge role um, and must take responsibility for combating uh, this epidemic. And I'm not just talking about COVID-19, but the, that responsibility also lays with the institutions of the EU member states and uh, of the union as a whole. Uh, misinformation uh, often confirms to its consumers that their reality the one that they feel exists actually is real. Uh, that if there's not an easy fix for their problems, there's at least the affirmation that the problem exists. To conclude, uh, the public has questions and we have to ask ourselves, why are often the first answers that, that pop up the fake ones? We, we just need to do more. And this infodemic, not, not only related to COVID-19, is a problem on a societal level. So it cannot be solved on an individual one. Journalists and fact checkers, uh, in my opinion, play an important role in that. Uh, support for fact checking organizations and, and its communities is, is necessary because our job as journalists is, is to provide verified factual information uh, in a transparent and open way. Uh, we at Factograph will continue to do that to the best of our ability, but we also expect the EU and its member state uh, to be an ally in our efforts aimed at uh, combating disinformation, uh, to support independent journalism and fact-checking, and to encourage critical thinking. Uh, we feel that otherwise the, the, the propagandists will win. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna, for uh, 
for your intervention, uh, for your introductory remarks, and and indeed for your for your job. I think uh, uh, and thank you for the for the insight you you gave us uh, to um, quite a hard job actually of of uh, fact checking uh, a platform. And I think uh, uh, we all, we all share that the, this this is an important action actually to take. And uh, um, uh, and we we heard also uh, your call for uh, more uh, support uh, from. Uh, the policymakers and, and from from the EU side and and I think um, uh, this this is an important uh, work strand that we, we should follow. Um, I would like just uh, an organization a small remark. Uh, I would like to ask uh, all uh, our MEP fellow colleagues or um, also those who are following us on on uh, website. Uh, just feel free to to send us uh, questions uh, during the intervention so that we can. And actually, uh, raise them with our panelists during, during the Q and &A, Q and A session, which will follow. And uh, I will immediately pass uh, the floor to uh, Dr. Maximilian Schubert uh, from EuroISPA uh, to give us uh, a little bit of insight to the role of internet services providers in the fight uh, against uh, disinformation. Maximilian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Kovarik. Uh, thank you to all the, the fellow panelists and for inviting us. And I would like to start off by saying, well, the discussion we're having today is not a new discussion because the question which information should be online and which, which shouldn't is probably as old as the Internet uh, itself. And I think also especially to COVID-19, um, the European providers, so our members, again, find themselves uh, between a, a rock and, uh, and a hard space. And uh, as you've already said previously in the day, when you, uh, during the introduction, our association uh, represents 2,300 providers. All over, all over the EU and EFTA and from all parts of the internet value chain. So to put it bluntly, I could also say, well, we are also representing 2,250 countries the general public has never heard about and most probably have never thought about. Um, and so whatever action is being taken in Brussels, we have to make sure that um, the, the measures you're thinking about will be proportionate for a small access provider in Italy up to a content provider in Finland. Um, and having this in, in, in background, I think when we look at the, the issues of illegal content, uh, for the last 20 years, we've been battling around and trying to, to find a way. And so, for example, there are some of our members which are running hotlines together with law enforcement to effectively tackle illegal content. So if we find, uh, if members of the public find illegal content, and especially manifestly illegal content like child sexual abuse material on the internet, they can report it to our hotlines and it will be taken down uh, in a very swift manner. But what we are discussing here today is not illegal content. Um, it might be disturbing, it might be worrisome, it might be weird, honestly speaking, but very often it's not illegal. And so the question we're having here today and which we are discussing quite a lot is how to deal with this not illegal content content, which is uh, this content which we frame as harmful. And I think that the discussion now that's going on in Brussels or pretty much around the globe is how which measures are available, first of all, and which are objectively best suited to tackle the challenge. And also, I think we should be very open about it. Which role should be addressed to the private sector, um, especially platforms when tackling it? And it was touched upon briefly uh, during the opening remarks of uh, Vice President, uh, the different concept there are around the globe, different concepts uh, of freedom of speech uh, exist. And so some measures uh, might be criticized in some part of the world, or let's say even without some part of Europe as being you know, censorship and the privatization of law enforcement and the judiciary. And other players, other stakeholders might be completely fine with it. So that, that is indeed uh, a, a challenge we see. And now coming to, to internet service providers, I guess for us the, the most important part is legal clarity. And this very clear distinction I was, I, I was speaking about, is it illegal or is it harmful? Because these are two totally different things from our perspective. And uh, this goes together with, uh, I would say, a certain degree of, of uh, flexibility, the necessary flexibility for us to address these tasks, uh, which society expects from us. Uh, so we can, for example, cooperate with fact checkers or establishing trusted flagging partnerships. And I guess when it comes to, to users, to people uploading stuff, it's also important for them to know what, what are the rules? Uh, why has the content been taken down? Do I have a right to uh, regress? Uh, uh, can I challenge the decision? 
and or what is the level of transparency. So there's a lot of discussion going on and we very much appreciate and we are very positive about the discussion that's going on because it's a topic that has been troubling us for the last 20 years and I think a general uh, public discussion bringing forward all the arguments is actually seen positive uh, by our side and I think honestly speaking uh, the solution will be found on the middle ground. Uh, it won't be uh, either one position saying well we're not going to do anything at all because you know that's the way it is or um, we, we're going to say, um, uh, or, do we, or we're going to say, we're going to do everything. So also that the, the timing is perfect. And please allow me now just to uh, switch to my slide. And so, what do ISPs uh, do? And and I think first of all, and that might be overlooked, uh, also in respect to COVID-19, we were making sure that everything is running smoothly. When you talk to ISPs and when you look at the PR, they will tell you, well, you know, easy peasy. It, it went quite well. It went easily. From looking behind the curtains, I can tell you that there was a challenge at some uh, at times for the internet service providers in, Austria, uh, in Europe, especially in respect to voice traffic or, for example, uh, equipment breaking down. Because also, if a, if a cell tower breaks down and it is within a quarantined area, area you know you have to replace it, but getting personnel in there um, to uh, exchange the parts was a challenge. And I think we're actually quite proud that we mastered it uh, quite well. And the Internet in general, I would say, is that uh, we've been pro we've proven to be the main connecting factor throughout this crisis. And we've enabled people to not only continue working, which I guess some people didn't appreciate that much, but also, more importantly, to stay in touch with family and friends. And so we have been kind of a a stabilizing factor. Now coming back to what was also said by Vice President Jurova at the beginning, um, elections. Yes, we all we already had some experience trying to tackle this issue uh, by elections, but in an election usually something confined to one area. It might be well, Europe might be a big area, but usually it's countries. So we have set up war rooms on to tackle misinformation and uh, this kind of information, but. Right now, we have 8 billion people being interested in the very same topic. So this is a big challenge for us. And uh, I guess these are uncertain times. Let's put it like that. And people are looking for very simple solutions and conspiracy theories. But my previous speakers are the expert on that, uh, offer this clarity when reality doesn't. And something that was already mentioned uh, today is uh, media literacy. And I think it's paramount. And we've been, we've been excellent you know, when it comes to media literacy for kids. You know, telling them uh, their children's books, etc. But we'll see right now that we really need to look at the the, the, at the overall population and uh, give them an understanding how to treat information defined on the internet. But now moving particularly to platforms, uh, what we did, and that was um, the promotion. Uh, uh, we we used our network and range of influence to promote the information from reliable sources. It was mentioned previously. The WHO, local health authorities. But once more, please keep in mind, um, the pandemic came swiftly, and then you should immediately get in touch with the right authorities in all the member states. And it might sound, uh, how to say, uh, easy to you, but I guess it was quite a challenge making sure you identify the right people to speak to and get the information they want to, to see pushed. And now looking back, um, when you look, for example, on the search engine of your choice for uh, symptoms related to COVID or, or general information, um, now looking back kind of miraculously, there was good information very central uh, on top of the, the search results or similar. Or, for example, I don't know if you're using a social media app. Uh, usually in the top part of the social media app, there was a little icon saying, well, are you actually interested in information about it? Because, you know, we have some information here which might be good for you. So this information was put there on purpose um, by the uh, by the platforms, but it was by no means as easy as it might look for the outside world to get the right information, to put it into the right format, and to convey it to the user in a format which is not considered as it being pushed upon them. Uh, the next point that was the removal of life-threatening content we already uh, that was already already uh, briefly mentioned today uh, when we saw uh, information which was really life-threatening, like you know, asking people to inject themselves uh, certain things or swallow Tide Pods. These were removed quite swiftly. And honestly speaking, yes, maybe we could have done or our members could have done uh, a better job in trying to identify them. 
but it's once again very difficult to find this information. And one of the, the most interesting or currently right the, the most controversial issue is the tagging of content, which has been which has been disapproved by by fact checkers, because there was also a learning for us um, in elections uh, previously on, and that was that if you just put a big label onto the information that it had that it's wrong, you know, that it was um, that it's dubious, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it turned out uh, that this might be seen as a seal of approval by some people trying to spread this news because that's, you know, just the Illuminati hitting down on you. And so it was actually carried with pride. So what we did, we had to look for different ways. And so we, we tagged it and most of the work was actually done in the back end, trying to make sure that the circulation of the tagged content is being reduced. That does not mean we removed it completely from the internet because freedom of speech, but we made sure, for example, it was not proposed actively to people for it. Once again, you could still find it, but we were trying to reduce um, uh, the rate that's, at which it, uh, it was uh, pushed out. And uh, I think this was quite a good compromise, uh, taking into consideration there are so many different as, uh, interests here at stake. And I think this ensures the freedom of speech is that the freedom of speech is upheld while the dissemination of harmful content was being reduced. Or another measure, uh, for example, was uh, limiting the number of how often or uh, to, to what big of a group a message can be forwarded on messaging services. This also worked out quite well, but was not only uh, perceived positively by the by the general public. And the last point that sort of has also been mentioned, um, actually quite a big proportion of conspiracy content, and we had the opportunity to gather some experience in this respect in previous elections, was... Um, that uh, some of this content was commercially motivated. So for us, it was to uh, kind of follow the money and to make sure that these people are not incentivized to put up more, even weirder theories by trying to cut them off on the advertisement revenues. But once again, you have to be quite careful in respect to freedom of speech. And I think we it's a, it's a work in progress. We are learning. And that's also something very important for us to say, well, we've, we see scientists, uh, we see activists, we see NGOs, and they have got their, their, their piece of advice. Uh, it is for us difficult to, to see which one to follow, uh, but I think we're doing actually quite a good job in this, and we're constantly trying to readjust our systems uh, to make sure we are all uh, reaching our goal. And I guess by that, I've uh, used up my speaking time, and all that's left for me to say is, well, that the industry, internet industry, is absolutely eager to play its part and to take on the responsibility it has, and we're happy. Uh, we are looking forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you, Maximilian, for uh, your interesting uh, presentation, and I, and I think uh, you mentioned many uh, many points that are actually. Uh, in the center of, of the discussion and, and also in the, in the center of policy action uh, that was that was mentioned not only by Vice President Jourova but but also by by other speakers and and uh, I, I fully agree with uh, what you what you said at the beginning that uh, basically the solution is to be found over the middle ground and I think this is this is this is very very uh, difficult also to strike the right balance uh, when when it comes to the approach and and thank you for uh, also uh, giving us. Uh, um, uh, quite uh, uh, a good picture of what uh, the the ISPs are are currently doing and and uh, sort of uh, taking us also to to, to the back room of, of the industry and giving giving us uh, insight insight in, uh, from 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 your side. Um, what is um, and I think I now uh, I will I will basically pass to uh, our next speaker. Uh, both uh, uh, Anna Brakus and Maximilian Schubert mentioned uh, media literacy as, as an important uh, part of, uh, of our action in uh, the framework of uh, countering the disinformation. And, um, uh, and I think uh, um, one of the best actually to give us uh, insight uh, from, let's say, the users or the recipient side um, of, of this information campaign uh, is uh, Julian von Rupert Bismarck, uh, a founder and the CEO of, of lie detectors. And uh, I think we'll be happy to uh, to learn uh, from, from your side and a little bit more about the literacy projects you, you are you are running and your experience with, uh, with the, current, the current situation and also maybe your recommendations when it comes to uh, the future action to take. Uh, Julian, uh, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. So first of all, thanks so much for hosting this. Um, such good points being made by all of these panelists. I wish we had more time and we had actual coffee networking breaks together. Um, and thank you for placing such an accent on this issue of disinformation. So lie detectors, as Andre said, is um, we are a journalist led nonprofit organization and we work to secure democracy by empowering young people and their teachers to sort fact from fiction online. Um, and like you all, we've been worried about disinformation for a long time. Um, and you know, right now it's particularly worrying time. Um, let me give you an example of just how widespread this issue is. So at the classrooms that we've been visiting just this week, um, virtually of course, um, have had Q and A's, we've facilitated Q and A's where the questions that come from the children that are all seated at two meters from each other um, include the following. Is it true that you can treat COVID with disinfectant? You know, is it true that the virus was made on purpose? And then interestingly, because there's been, well, for whatever reason, but very interestingly, very recently, how can we trust fact checkers? Aren't they just trying to make money? Um, so, you know, there are a lot of regulatory and co-regulatory approaches that, you know, that you, you know, MEPs and um, are going to be considering um, here in Brussels and in other EU capitals. And, you know, surely they can do a lot in terms of considering when does a platform become a natural um, monopoly and need to be treated as a utility, a public utility? How do you, um, you know, disrupt the business model of this outrage industry that so many of us have been speaking about today? And I'm talking particularly about the, the role that platforms play play in this, um, you know, considering limits to gathering and monetizing of what is actually hyper-personal data, such as human emotions of fear and anger. Um, and I also do understand the focus of what Vice President Eurova has just now said, um, was, you know, the transparent, a need for transparent and consistent moderation policies. Um, and I see what great work many organizations are doing on this. Nonetheless, what worries us is that regulation won't get done fast enough um, and content moderation just won't be effective enough. Um, you know, as important as fact checking may be for those who do consult those kind of sites, um, the campaigns are increasingly sophisticated, as many of you have said, um, and they can confound the most experienced of fact checkers, um, let alone questions of, um, uh, of censorship. Um, and much of this is not happening in the places that we can moderate. Much of this is happening in what Mark Zuckerberg calls the digital living room, these private, unmoderated spaces where so many people travel. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and so this is why our focus is on building resilience. This is the word that um, Vice President Yerova used this morning. Um, and that's resilience, that means critical information literacy, lateral literacy, the ability to look left and right before going ahead and choosing uh, the correct fact. Um, and this is, you know, in our view, key to ensuring that everybody independently of what independent, you know, platform players or organizations might be doing to help secure us, people actually have the, the safety belt, the seat belt um, to navigate safely on the internet. Um, and so practically um, what we do actually at Lighter Tech is we train and we send and journalists into classrooms, currently virtually, I can talk to you about that separately, um, to work with children aged 10 to 15 on how to recognize fakes, um, why it matters, it's actually increasingly important to make it relevant, why that actually is an important distinction to make between fact and fiction, and also how journalism works. And what we found in the classrooms, and we work with about 200 journalists at the moment um, in three different countries, and we'll be adding more, is that young people inform themselves very differently than we adults do. They don't think in terms of sources, they think in terms of platforms. Where did you get that? It'll be, you know, it won't be whatever, The Economist or something, it'll be Instagram or whatever. And when it does come to platforms, forget Twitter and Facebook. A lot of this is happening on very visual platforms, on video-based platforms, on platforms that we might not even have heard of, like TikTok and Twitch, even gaming platforms like Fortnite. I could show you a, a graph. I don't know if you can actually see it, but the very highest ones there, this is, this is children's media consumption. The red ones are the 14 and 15 year olds. The green ones are the uh, 10 and 11 year olds. The top graphs, forgive my handwriting, uh, are reserved for WhatsApp, YouTube, um, Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram, of course. And the very lowest ones down here are Facebook and Twitter. Um, 
Um, and often um, teachers may be aware, the other thing that we found, teachers may be aware that um, disinformation is an issue, but they often tell us that they don't know how to address this in the classroom themselves. Um, and we've also found, because we work in very, very different and very diverse kinds of schools, um, that disinformation knows no boundaries. Um, it does not distinguish between you know, rich and poor. Um, um, but what's very encouraging is that for the school children that we do visit, once you make it relevant, and coronavirus is actually a particularly interesting point because it is making it relevant to distinguish between fake and fact in a way that hasn't been the case always, um, is once, once you've actually made it relevant to them, you can actually make a difference. There's lots of studies. Stephen Lewandowski does very interesting work on pre-bunking versus debunking. Um, it's really about triggering a behavioral change of actually encouraging people to stop and think who wrote it, who's behind this video, is it a credible source, all the things that we might do naturally, um, but that might actually take a little bit of training. Um, and these sort of questions um, are terribly important uh, in our view, and it's something that we want to see integrated into all school curricula and also into teacher training curricula. Um, and I can, again, I'll speak to you um, separately about coronavirus, if you like, um, and the effect that that's had on media literacy training at the moment, because people aren't going back to school uniformly. Um, but Andre asked me specifically also to address what those of you who are watching, who are MEPs, might be able to do about this. So yes, of course, uh, education is not an EU competence, um, but you'll be pleased to know that I've come up with five things that you can do. So on the EU level, on the regulatory level, get involved, get involved, consider the digital living room when you're thinking about this. Consider how much of this is traveling on the unmoderated, in, you know, in the unmoderated spaces. Um, consider actually working on disrupting the business uh, model of the platforms that facilitates this outrage industry. Um, and then on an international level, a very active international player on education is the OECD. And the EU is a working member of, of the OECD as representatives of the EU demand that the OECD press on with the work that it is starting um, to consider integrating lateral literacy into its school rankings gauges and those school ranking gauges are actually very prestigious and people do care about them um, so it's a good it's a good incentive to give to the schools um, third uh, for those of you who are in countries that are members of the OECD do the same thing on a national level you know demand that the OECD press on with this kind of work um, also on a national level demand that media literacy be integrated into school curricula and demand that it become part of all teacher training curricula so that all teachers, regardless of whether they are teaching biology or, or, or ethics or politics or history or primary school level, are actually able to address this. And it doesn't fall by the wayside as a peripheral subject as we're seeing right now during Corona lockdown times. Um, and, you know, there's some, yes, it's difficult to train teachers. They're very busy. You can't train them very easily. But when you do, the effect is actually remarkably positive. We've seen the teachers that we've trained, and we're doing that increasingly, um, when they integrate um, this kind of uh, training into their curricula, we don't have to go there anymore. They don't need us anymore. Um, also, you have money. European Parliament has money. Uh, Lie Detectors is very lucky to be fully funded, but other initiatives really need funding. Um, so here's what you can do. You can allocate funds and you can also allocate funds in a way that ensures the independence of these efforts. Um, we've seen um, there's a great wish of big tech and the platforms to get involved but let's not dig ourselves into deeper debt to the platforms because it risks tying our hands in the long term. So um, our view is you know there's a lot that can be done um, and it can be done quite quickly. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julian, for, uh, for your intervention. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, actually a very, uh, very interesting excursion in, into uh, the world of, of uh, young people and, and, and children uh, in facing uh, actually the, the disinformation campaigns and, uh, and the sort of um, building up their capacities actually to uh, distinguish between what is uh, reliable and what is not reliable content. And I think this, this is an important uh, point to mention. And also thank you for uh, giving us sort of uh, indications where uh, the, the public action can actually um, head to and, and what should be our, our target areas uh, in, in, in this regard. Um, uh, thank you for, for your interventions. I would like to ask my colleagues whether 
uh, they have some some questions or where, where, whether they would like to intervene. We still have a couple of minutes left for um, some some questions and answers. And uh, in the meantime, before uh, someone else, I may then a little bit use my position as a moderator and maybe raise some questions myself as well. Um, maybe I would start with uh, with Anna. Um, you mentioned that uh, you made uh, over 100 uh, fact checking uh, or fact checks uh, since the, the February. So let's say since the, the pandemic actually uh, uh, outbroke. Um, you were basically following, but you were following uh, the, the, the the internet also before. Uh, have you already saw or have you uh, sort of uh, identified some signs of uh, uh, approaching infodemic or uh, uh, let's say stronger presence of COVID related issues in the disinformation campaigns uh, already before February? Were there some signs, you know, when when um, uh, the virus was detected already in China back in December or January? Uh, have, have you already seen, you know, some indications that we can actually be facing a, a sort of infodemic? And if so, what, what were those signs actually uh, uh, present already in, in, the, in, in the online world? Mm. Well, uh, thank you. It's a... Um... So what, what we noticed in January is that in, uh, in other countries, it was starting. Uh, we, we can know that uh, because we are the part of uh, IFCN, which, which, which actually has a lot of fact-checking organizations from uh, all over the world. So what we did notice is that it was slowly starting in some countries. Uh, in Europe, in my opinion, it, it, it had to... Um, it had to go past January that, that, so that it could really, really start. Um, in, in the beginning, as I said, uh, we mostly noticed, um, it, it, it was mostly mockery, like, is, is this really happening? Uh, some uh, mm, jokes being made about it. But as it got more serious, uh, so, did the, so did the hoaxes, so did the misinformation, and so did disinformation. So uh, it, it really grew as the virus spread. Um, what, what we started noticing uh, probably by the end of March uh, was this creation of uh, what we called super theories. Uh, um, uh, one of the speakers, um, uh, Rudy, mentioned that uh, in his panel, uh, is that conspiracy theories feed off each other. So what we noticed by the end of March is, is this creation of super theories that include anti, anti-vaxxers, uh, 5G, Bill Gates, George Soros, uh, uh, China, Russia, the US, everything all bumped into one. And that's, that, that was really, really interesting for us to see uh, uh, how uh, how they how they share information and how basically we, we could see in in real time uh, how they feed off of each other. Uh, I, I believe that, um, and I will finish up now, is that that was very useful for us because th th this was this will give us an opportunity to learn and research uh, how how this infodemic spread on a global level and what what interactions. Uh, we can see uh, be between different uh, disinformation creators. So, yeah, it, it, it grew month by month. And it's not going to stop, by the way, not anytime soon. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's going to just spill into, into other things. Uh, and uh, it, it's going to be here for a very, very long time. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for this interesting insight. Obviously, mentioning the concept of super theories, I think it's, it's that's very relevant. And uh, well, uh, let's hope that we can uh, sort of um, uh, make sure that uh, that the long time is a little bit shortened by uh, our our uh, not only our action but also uh, your work. Um, if you allow, I, I would have a short question, unless there is someone else who wants to intervene to Maximilian. Um, regarding uh, the, the industry, uh, we are obviously talking about a lot of new technologies uh, being available, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, uh, very high power computing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, will uh, those actually have a, have a role actually to play on one hand to, to help the industry and, and, and to help uh, us actually countering the, the campaigns or they, they have potential 
actually to be uh, sort of enhancing the, the spread of uh, disinformation? And how, how do you see it, actually the, the potential benefits, the pros and cons of, of new technologies being uh, deployed in this area? Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a very valid question. Uh, I think as our industry, we're usually uh, the first ones to try out new things. And we're also very, of course, very positive when we go forward and say, well, you look, there could be potential in that. Uh, maybe, you know, this can help us analyze uh, materials so we don't need humans to look into it. But what we have seen so far is that, um, well, the hopes of the of the silver bullets flying around haven't come true so far. There's, there's some software available helping us to pre-categorize uh, certain kind of material and, and to make sure it makes the workflow easier for us. But when it comes, when it comes down to really finding fine light, the fine line between you know, humoristic um, aspects or you know, so, so, um, really evaluating if this should be acceptable, is it still an opinion someone can have or is it going just a bit too far? Uh, we still rely in, on humans. And I think it's, it's also very important to keep in mind that, so to speak, the other side exactly knows how far they can go. So the, if it were just black and white, I guess we would have, a, we ha we would have a software doing that and uh, it would be also be quicker, et cetera, more cost efficient and we like stuff like this. But uh, for now, I'm afraid we have to say we are uh, extremely grateful for a reason for the people like Anna or Julian who who are out there helping us flagging material which we think is is inappropriate and which should be taken down, and also people who are telling um, well multiple um, people like teachers or also kids be careful and be careful what you see because it it mutates so quickly that it's very difficult to to follow up. And maybe just one last point. Um, there are things called trusted flagging partnerships. They have got different names for, for different companies. And what, the, what this is, is that if we see, for example, there's an entity, there's an NGO, and we are getting 100 reports from them, and actually 98 of them are, are splendid, they're superb, and we say, well, of course, we follow them. They might get a different treatment than someone who is just reporting something for the first time. Or we have an NGO, and we say 80% of what they're sending in, unfortunately, we can't agree on. So when we see there's a high quality uh, source for us, we are trying to make sure there are processes in place that when they are reporting to us, they don't have to go through seven loops, so to speak, but only through five loops or three loops. So that's also something we as, as Eurisp are very actively looking into trying to share this best practice. And we have just, we're working on uh, in the light of the DSA on, on our consensus uh, principles for intermediate liability. And that's one of the things we are, uh, we are keeping in focus because it's the human factor which uh, helps us move forward. Thank you. Um, thank you for for clarifying that. Uh, I think it's a it's an indeed an important uh, point you made in the end uh, about uh, not not uh, forgetting the, the human factor uh, in in the end. Um, uh, I would have one last question, unless there's uh, so someone else uh, wants to intervene. Uh, to, to Julian, uh, you mentioned you mentioned the the, the quite high efficiency of, of uh, training of teachers, um, which I think is is a very important point you made uh, in in your intervention. Um, I mean. Uh, my question would be, obviously, by training a teacher, you sort of build up a, uh, let's say, a general competences of, of uh, teachers, uh, teachers being able to uh, helping young people um, di di diversifying their sources of information, etc. But um, how fast or how, how reactive can we can we be with training the teachers in uh, such a fast moving uh, context such as COVID crisis, where basically young people are uh, constantly uh, exposed to uh, a various types of information, and obviously they they would also look for uh, answers maybe from from uh, their mentors from 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 uh, teachers at, in schools. Um, is is there possibility actually to be to be reactive and and provide uh, teachers with uh, relevant uh, competencies 
uh, even during the, the crisis. Anna mentioned that we might be, for, you know, exposed to to this for quite a long time. So I think the uh, sooner the competences is built, uh, maybe the the better the result in the end. So um, can you give us a little bit more insight on, on this on this uh, question? Yes, and I could talk about that for a really long time because teachers are actually an incredibly interesting animal. They're really difficult to gauge. They vary enormously from civil servants who've been doing the same course brilliantly for 40 years but cannot be moved from their curriculum to very young ones who are very dynamic. Um, what we have found is that, um, so the way we work is we work with the children. That's our official audience and Indirectly, we get at the teachers. We get invited into classrooms sometimes only because the teachers need a break because it's a very stressful environment. They want to sit back and just let somebody else take over for a while. But that actually helps to trigger their interest. Um, we found now in Corona times that the teachers are particularly interested. Yes, they're overwhelmed. Yes, they are overwhelmed, particularly in this strange hybrid return to school time. And nonetheless, um, they are asking us to come. Um, and and and. And, and what we do, actually, we call this a tandem um, program, is we, we think that the way to do it is actually to do it gradually. You can't get a teacher to take a one-day course and be done with it. This has got to be a gradual, um, you know, because uh, they do that all the time, you know. There's got to be a gradual getting to know, just like us, we've got to learn how to fact check, you know. I've got to learn how to do a reverse image search, you know, to see whether the shark was really swimming down, you know, Venice or something like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is slow. Teachers also are not necessarily naturally inclined to say, I don't know. Um, that's not their job. It's actually their job to know. And actually to retrain them, you have to really think about things um, in terms of group work, either work, having them work together in groups and learn together or learn together with the students. Um, and that's what we're, we're currently in a hybrid phase. We had planned to do a very specific tandem program and start that this year between journalists and groups of teachers so that they could work in groups together long term, long term, accompanying them and eventually letting them go and doing it. Um, and at the moment, we're doing it far more through our Corona format, which is actually various, quite a lengthy one to three week process where the kids have to work quite hard on various fakes and discover whether they're real or not. And the teachers, just by marking them, actually learn quite a lot. So it's a really long, I'm sorry not to be able to answer it more shortly. It's a, it's a difficult process, but it can really yield an awful lot of benefits. And once they've got it, they're really pleased because they do worry. You know, we have 80% of teachers saying, we worry about this, we know it's an issue, and 40% of teachers saying, we have addressed this in the classroom, and that's a problem. It's something that can be done, you know, and this is actually something that, um, you know, that there can be a real win also, you know, country by country, it's got to be done country by country, and in other uh, countries, it's got to be done region by region, like Germany, for instance, but it can be a real thing that, um, you know, it, that it, it results are really possible there if you do it intelligently. Yeah, thank you. Like to, thank you. Thank if you, for you don't that. mind, I would just like to underline yes. something that I've noticed is uh, uh, so, sometimes when we talk about disinformation and misinformation, we, we, we focus a lot on um, on our approach, you know, uh, being very rational. But I, I believe and um, that that we do need to work more on empathy. We need to understand more why people believe in certain things we also need to sometimes we need to i believe put ourselves more in their shoes and try to understand what's going on so for example you have these fake prize contests on facebook for example uh like um write a comment share this and you will win a prize that's a uh, i don't know a 200 euro coupon to do something and you can think of it of, of being silly and you can ask yourself, you know, why would somebody share this? It's obviously fake. But it, 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 there are a lot of important issues in that. So people want to believe that because a lot of them don't have money. They, they really want to believe that. They need it. And that's why they're willing to, uh, in order to participate in the game, they're willing to give their personal information, their ID cards, their credit cards. And that, that's not just about, you know, stealing information on a, on a personal level. We actually do not know, are the people that, that run those kinds of games, are they well organized? Do they share that information? And that's something we have to think about when, uh, especially in COVID times, when we are thinking about uh, how people are going to vote all over Europe. So if 
if you if you don't uh, try to address the root of the problem and that's why do people want to believe this why do they believe it then i don't think we can we can we can solve the uh, that question, no matter how many fact checks uh, we do, or no matter how good we we we, we teach people to to look, uh, you know, uh, to the left or to the right, and before they head out out there and and go straight ahead, as you wonderfully put it. So that's also I I agree. We need to be rational, but we also need to be a little bit more empathetic uh, to the people that actually share these kinds of things. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Anna, for raising this uh, this general point. I think it's a, it's a very very good one and, and a valid one as well. And and thank you, Julian, for actually um, um, enlightening a little bit uh, your activities when it comes to uh, training your teachers. Um, I I understand that we could you know talk about this for a very long very long time, <laughs> but um, I think we will just pass the relay right now to the third panel uh, uh, of. Uh, 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 our our uh, panelists, uh, which will be uh, moderated by my colleague uh, Bart Grothuis, uh, and uh, without any further delay, I will thank all the panelists, Anna, Maximilian, and Julian, for uh, uh, taking part in this very good and interesting debate. I think a very um, uh, quite a number of uh, valid points were were raised, and and uh, I think um, the next panel will will just follow. Uh, so Bart. Uh, floor is yours, and uh, we're looking forward to a discussion of the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. Thank you very much for all the uh, speakers. It's been a very prolific and engaging debate. So I'm looking forward to the next uh, phase we're going in, and it concerns nation states. It's a foreign policy perspective. We are confronted with adversarial nation states who try to influence our behavior, our political sovereignty, and others. And what we try to do is impose costs on other nations in order to influence their behavior. And we have three very, very distinguished guests in our midst, um, who I've been following for many years. They might not know, but I've been a fan of them for years. Uh, let me begin with uh, Jakub, uh, Jakub Kalensky. Um, he was a team lead for countering disinformation at the European External Action Service. So he knows uh, by working on this for many years, how it works with foreign and adversarial nation states. And from FC Barcelona, he went to Real Madrid because now he's working uh, with uh, the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab, which is a uh, based in the Czech Republic. And they identify, they identify, expose and explain uh, adversarial uh, behaviors. So I'd very much like to hear from him what, what he sees, where it's going through. And then we have Patrick Pavlak. And Patrick, welcome. Um, you're one of the people that actually uh, was the architects of the cyber diplomacy toolbox, which, of which I'm a big fan. It enables the European Union uh, to act in a geopolitical context against adversarial nation states in order to impose sanction and many other instruments. And what I was wondering, can we use that toolbox also for uh, troll factories in Russia and China, etc. Can we expand that? And what other uh, techniques do you see and what norms, which are very prolific on norm and cyber diplomacy as well. I'd like to hear from you what you think of that and how that evolves. And then last but not least, Thomas Ridd. He's a professor uh, at the John Hopkins University. And before that, he was a professor of security studies in, um, in London at uh, the Department of War Studies at King's College. It's one of the most brilliant uh, academics I know. He's recently uh, published a book called Active Measures, the History of Disinformation. I very much recommend, he's good. He's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book to read. Um, he's also able to place some things in historical context and how nation states have behaved uh, previously. So with these three people, I'd like to introduce um, I'd like to begin and give the word to, uh, to Jakub. Let me uh, just uh, start with you. And if you could have an introduction on your themes, and we'll be heading the word towards Patrick and then Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And, and uh, I will have to make sure that my colleagues in DC know that they are considered the Real Madrid of disinformation. That's very nice to hear. <laughs> uh, Thanks for having me as well. And, and let me say that I'm really very, very happy that we are finally discussing this, this particular topic. As you mentioned, I've been working on countering disinformation on, on a daily basis since uh, 2015, uh, when it was a problem that 
not that many people in the West acknowledged, and I, I hope I have seen quite a few of the best practices in Europe and around the world. And I strongly believe that it is exactly this aspect, introducing costs for the information aggression, that is mostly missing in our activities. We can try and raise media literacy as high as possible, but this will never stop the information aggressors. We can try and press social media platforms to do more against inauthentic behavior, but this will never stop the information aggressors. We can document the disinformation messages and debunk the most harmful pieces of disinformation, as my previous colleagues in East Stratcom are brilliantly doing. And we can try and raise awareness about the topic and we can try to vaccinate people against disinformation. But all that will only force the information aggressors to adapt to a new environment. It will never stop them. If there is a lesson in the past five years, it is this. If we want to do something real against disinformation, we have to be stopping the disinformers. In the last year or more, I, I was advocating for something that I call four lines of defense. And I believe that we need to be doing significantly more in every single department in order to stop losing the information confrontation. Yes, I, I am afraid that we are losing the information confrontation at the moment. Uh, so the first line of, of defense is uh, documenting of the threat so that we would know more about it. And although there has been some progress made, we still lack a lot of data, not only about how many channels spreading disinformation there are, how many messages per day they spread, but also, for example, about the impact. Some of the opinion polls show us that the Russian disinformation activities can achieve quite a significant impact in the society, uh, in the worst cases ranging from 20 up to 50% of the population. These are really worrying numbers. We need more of these opinion polls and we need them more regularly in order to see, to see how big the problem is, whether it is increasing or decreasing. The second line of defense would be raising awareness about the threat. Uh, we need better communication campaigns and we need to think about engaging more audiences. Audiences that, for example, us, the, the men in suits, will, will never reach. Teenagers or, or pensioners in the rural areas. The third line of defense would be repairing the weaknesses that the disinformers exploit. And there has been said quite a lot about it today. It might be the tensions between various socioeconomic groups. It might be the lower media literacy levels. It might be the social media environment that is also a weakness that gets exploited. But all that will never be enough because it does not stop the information aggression. And therefore, we need the fourth line of defense which is something that we are not doing very much at the moment, unlike the lines of defense mentioned uh, previously. And that's stopping the aggressor, punishing him for his aggression, making it more costly, which will also deter other potential aggressors. So in this regard, we can start by simply boycotting the pro-Kremlin or Kremlin's pseudo-media. The so-called journalists of Russian state media openly declare that they are in an information war with us in the West. They openly state that Russia Today and Sputnik are something like their Ministry of Defense in the information space. They openly say that persuading people with their propaganda is cheaper than killing people. The top Russian journalist, Dmitry Kiselyov, said that his job is a cheaper alternative to killing people. They cannot be more clear about the military mission they have. Every person engaging with these pseudo-media every politician answering their question, everybody who is treating them like any other media outlet, these people are helping the Kremlin's information war. Therefore, I, I find really worrying the, the recent decision of Reuters to partner up with uh, the Russian news agency TASS, which, by the way, stands for Telegraph Agency of the Soviet Union. They are still called <laughs> after this dictatorship. Apart from boycotting, we could be also sanctioning the disinformers. Currently, there is only one person from among the pseudo-journalists uh, on the sanctions list of the European Union, and that's the already mentioned Dmitry Kiselyov, the chief Russian propagandist, uh, the man who says that Russia can turn the US into a pile of radioactive ashes, or that gay people shouldn't be allowed to donate blood and that their organs should be burned and can't be donated. So this person is on the EU sanctions list for his role in the annexation of Crimea. But right on the same channel, just right before Dmitry Kisilyov's show, there is Vladimir Solovyov. He uses his show to spread the same kind of hatred against Westerners and other nations. In his show, he and his guests regularly deny the right of Ukraine to exist. They accuse Poland of starring, starting World War II. They claim that the European countries are run by the US or that we are becoming more Nazi and fascist. Uh, 
uh, that Europe plans a new Barbarossa plan to invade Russia, uh, that white helmets organize chemical attacks against Syria. And after this hate spreading show, he sits on the plane, flies to Italy, and he enjoys his villa at Lago di Como. <laughs> How is that possible? We not only do, don't do anything against such a violent propagandist, we even welcome his money earned by lying about us. <laughs> we should be also sanctioning the disinformation organizations. When you look at the list of the biggest advertisers on Russian state media, it's Western companies like Pepsi, Nestle, Procter & Gamble. Western companies are paying for anti-Western propaganda for a massive brainwashing operation aimed to discredit the West, to discredit the idea of democracy and freedom, the very principles that made the success of these companies possible. We should be using the already existing laws about inciting hatred against a group of people. The program media regularly spread hatred against migrants, against Ukrainians, against Westerners. We could be using laws about spreading libels and slanders and defamation. When they accuse Angela Merkel of being Adolf Hitler's daughter or that the EU is being, right, uh, being run by a gay conspiracy aiming to change children's sexes, this is spreading libel, this is spreading defamation. We could be using the laws we have. We could be using laws about inciting violence and war. They have been doing that in Latvia and, and Lithuania. In almost every country, there are laws we could be using. And one final point, and it almost pains me to say something as obvious, but we must finally start investigating the Kremlin's information aggression. I, I, I wouldn't say that the Americans are handling the information aggression brilliantly, but they are doing one thing that we are not doing at all. They are investigating the attacks on their democracy in 2016. And there have been already indictments and other legal consequences resulting from this investigation. How come that no European country is doing something similar? There have been at least 16 elections and referenda targeted by Russian information operations only since 2014, and there is not a single similar investigation. But if we don't investigate, we can't identify the perpetrators. We can't identify the criminals who would deserve the punishment. And if we don't identify, identify them, we can't justly punish them. We, we, have to be start, we have to start taking the attacks on our democracies more seriously. We have to start investigating them and draw some consequences from this. So, so I believe there is actually much more we could be doing in this regard, in this uh, introducing the costs for, for the aggressors. And I believe that the, some of the measures could maybe not solve the problem, but hopefully significantly improve our position in, in this struggle. And I think that we actually know that we should be doing this. I think all we miss is, is the political will for this. So therefore, once again, I am really happy that we are having this discussion with the MEPs, and I will be happy to answer the questions after. Well, for all the viewers, you know why you know now why I invited uh, Jakub. <laughs> He's very prolific on <laughs> on this subject, and uh, I usually invite people I disagree with, but I agree with everything he said. But we will stay in contact even after. But thank you, Jakub. Uh, very much appreciated. We'll be back with you in a minute. I'd like to go to Patrick Patrick Pavlak. He works at the uh, European Union Institute for Security Studies, which is a think tank. And uh, I mean, uh, this is a rock star as well. So please, but inform us how you see this. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, general introduction. You know, for analysts and researchers, it's always good to know that we have fans and there are people who follow their work. So I uh, very much appreciate those uh, remarks at the beginning. Um, and because we are already over time, let me really jump directly to the uh, question that you have asked us to answer, which is how can we actually increase the costs for uh, the dis disinformation operations and how we actually impose uh, consequences on uh, the perpetrators. Um, in the question that you have asked, there is already this presumption that states are the ones responsible. And Jakub has already alluded to the fact that uh, you know, there is a big challenge linked to the political will that uh, needs to be present for us to do something very concrete. Um, but many issues that he also raised in his presentation, to me, really boiled down to the question about the legal and political framework that we are operating with. So what I would like to do is maybe take us a step back and really try to dissect the big question that you have asked into a three smaller one. 
Uh, and how I would like to answer it with a very methodological approach would be first by asking, you know, when we think about consequences, we really have to have a very good understanding of what type of operations are we really talking about? Are we talking about purely misinformation, disinformation uh, campaigns that are happening, like those that we have seen around uh, COVID-19? Or are we maybe talking about disinformation campaigns that have been designed on the basis of the information that has been stolen uh, by gaining illegal access to IT uh, systems of a political party, political institution, or any other organization? Uh, or are we maybe talking about misinformation and disinformation campaigns that have been designed to actually facilitate this illegal access? So the phishing campaigns, fraud, scams, everything that has associated uh, and accompanied the discussions about COVID-19. And it's really important to answer those three questions because depending on that, we actually are operating within very different legal and policy framework, which gives us less or more political and legal tools to respond. Once we move past this uh, first step, I think the next question is really, are the activities we're talking about breaching uh, and do they constitute a violation of any domestic or international law that is out there? Because that also creates additional opportunities for response. It can be through the law enforcement means. Jakub mentioned defamation laws, for instance, which open the opportunity for law enforcement uh, actions. Uh, but there are many more that we can be looking uh, into. So I here went wild uh, following uh, your suggestions to give you uh, exhaustive answers and try to compile a list of different directions that we could be looking at. We could be looking at this information as a violation of national laws. So that can be criminal laws based on the fight against cyber crime. Uh, but also the defamation laws that were already mentioned, for instance. We could think of this information as a violation of contractual obligations by the users. This is primarily what we discuss with the online uh, social media platforms, and that's something that Commissioner Jourova has really uh, spoken about at length. But we can also talk about violations of specific rules of international law. And here I'm stretching a bit. I'm sure that this is a subject for the discussion among international lawyers. But you could think about this information as a violation of the right to health, for instance. Uh, the fact that we have the information being spread uh, about what are the right cures, how to actually protect yourself, or being the victim of a scam that offers you the vaccine that at the end uh, has never been really designed, might be potentially at the international uh, stage considered a violation of uh, the right to health in line with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 25, and many other uh, international law uh, regulations that are out there. This information can also be viewed as a violation of freedom of expression. Uh, freedom of expression is not only the right to say what you want, but it's also my right to receive the right information. We had this debate in 2019 around the European elections, where actually the parliament really engaged in the discussion about fair elections, right? So access to verified factual information is something that we consider to be uh, our right. And that again is reflected in Article 19 of the United uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights. But you could also look at this information as a violation of good relations among states. You could also look at it as a violation of a principle of non-intervention, which is in Article 2 of the UN Charter. So all this to say that depending really of how you define the problem, you can be looking for answers in many different directions. Of course, when we talk about um, states being responsible, we're already entering the ground in conversation about the attribution. How do we actually know who the perpetrators are? Is it the state or is it maybe the group of patriotic hackers, as some countries like to state, that is behind the specific attack. So that again opens us and opens different pathways uh, for the response, whether criminal law, international law, engagement for the UN or other international bodies that we would like to see. And that brings me to the final and uh, most interesting uh, part of this discussion, I think, which is about the imposition of, of costs. And I think I share Jakub's frustration that this is probably one of the least explored elements uh, in this conversation. And I try to understand why. Um, uh, if you look at the responses and most of the discussions we have had really uh, so far uh, throughout this webinar, most of them are really more on the prevention slash uh, strengthening resilience side, right? So we have uh, the discussion about cooperation with social media platforms, strengthening digital and online information literacy 
uh, we have uh, propositions to support fact checker networks and so on and so forth. Commissioner Yurnova has really spoken about those. But these are really uh, steps that we can take to kind of prevent and maybe increase the costs for the perpetrators, right? So we make it more difficult for them. We push them to design maybe a more sophisticated messaging to come up with uh, the campaigns that might be more effective and so on and so forth. That's the, uh, that's the kind of increasing the cost side uh, and the, uh, that, we can, uh, that we can address through the prevention and strengthening resilience aspect. The more interesting part, and that's something that I'm looking at, and primarily also in the context of the cyber diplomacy toolbox that you have already mentioned, is uh, the political response that we can take vis-a-vis uh, -vis those countries that um, commit disinformation uh, acts and engage into disinformation operations. So assuming that we have already established that responsibility, that we know that the state is behind those campaigns and we have evidence, what can be done? Uh, I think there are a few examples of what is already happening. Uh, so, for instance, the activities of the EU versus this info that was already mentioned would be something that we could label, you know, calling out the perpetrators, naming and shaming, or raising awareness about the different te uh, techniques uh, being deployed. Uh, we have law enforcement response as well through international cooperation, mutual legal assistance acts, indictments, and so on. Uh, but that seems not to be enough. As Jakub said, you know, we're still in the zone where everybody can do uh, what they want without the fear of being punished. So do we really have to uh, give up or can we think about more creative ways of uh, addressing and dealing with the perpetrators? And here I let my imagination go a bit wild. Uh, that might be some of the uh, suggestions that you uh, may want to pick up afterwards, but that's something that uh, is not happening, but maybe could. So when we talk about cyber diplomacy toolbox, as you know very well, this really addresses primarily um, the challenge or of uh, a potential conflict in cyberspace, strengthening accountability for violation of norms of international law, and promoting responsible state behavior in cyberspace. So if you think about those all international acts that I've mentioned before, uh, you could think of this information as a violation of international law and potentially yeah. being subjected and falling under the scope of cyber diplomacy toolbox. Yeah. Why not? Uh, Fighting disinformation is also part of the main objective that we actually promote as the European Union, which is maintaining free, open and secure cyberspace. Well, if we cannot be sure that the information we receive is free that, uh, and uh, factual, that is really problematic. If we do not have open media in countries like Russia, China and others, where actually this uh, media pluralism that we're promoting within the EU cannot really be guaranteed, that's maybe also something that we should be looking more closely into and push for political actions. Um, Jakub has men mentioned sanctions before, and I'm glad he also uh, clarified that the sanctions on KCF that we already have in place have been uh, adopted in the context of um, annexation of Crimea. There we really have the regime that's in place. Now, when we, when we talk about this information, we do not really have anything for the moment that could potentially address that. So if you look at the uh, cyber sanctions regime, for instance, that has been adopted, uh, there, there is this requirement of um, uh, intervention or unlawful access into the IT systems of another country, uh, where it's only disinformation campaign. I think it will be difficult to uh, employ this regime in that context. But you may remember I mentioned two other instances where potentially resorting to sanctions, or a cyber sanctions regime might be useful. So if a disinformation campaign is designed on the basis of information that has been stolen by the hackers from the networks of a political institution or organization, that potentially would open the door for the EU cyber sanction regime to be deployed, even member states considers as, um, as a significant uh, bridge. Now, um, we could also explore another option that is currently being debated, which is a human rights uh, sanctions regime, which has not been adopted yet, but is currently under uh, discussion. Again, you may recall those human rights articles that I have mentioned, 19 and 25. If we consider this information as a violation of human rights, that potentially, again, opens the gate for us to um, employ this new 
hopefully to be adopted human rights sanctions regime in to fight uh, disinformation. And then, of course, uh, there is this whole objective of building resilience globally. Uh, Jakob is skeptical. I am probably a bit more optimistic about that. So we have a currently EU action plan on human rights. We also have democracy and, uh, and sorry, a European democracy action plan that Commission Europa also mentioned. So these again are the possibilities that we can employ to probably uh, beef up a bit our responses to, um, to those Super. attacks. And of course, there is also the nuclear option, as you mentioned, hacking back against <laughs> all factors, which is something that uh, United States have uh, already done. Uh, it's this an option for the European Union? I don't know, but that's again something to, for uh, for the discussion today or Thanks. at the later stage. Thank you very much. Super, Patrick. Thank you very, very much. And as an architect of the cyber diplomacy toolbox, who is better to talk about it than you? I have a couple of viewers' questions. I have a lot of questions, but let me just introduce a couple of uh, people who are watching this uh, webinar, and they have a couple of urgent questions to both of you. And let me start by Jakub. We have one that says, uh, have you seen any disinformation campaigns recently about Black Lives Matter? Another one has said, have you seen any recent disinformation games about, uh, against the um, recovery fund here in Europe or the disinformation campaigns? And so Discord in Europe as well. Others, and then a question to you as well. Should we partner up with the US to tackle disinformation together and to increase the cost of foreign state actors? Jakob, I'd like to give you the floor to you. Thank you. Um, regarding the recovery fund, that will be very quick. I, I haven't seen much disinformation about that. Um, about the recent protests in the United States, uh, we can actually see something that, that's happening during om almost every, every similar, similar crisis. Um, I'm from Czech Republic. We had this uh, Czechoslovak defector, Ladislav Bitman. I believe Thomas is quoting him in, in his book as well. Um, he used to work on disinformation in the 60s and he said that the work of disinformer is something like an evil doctor he tries to make the precise diagnosis of his patient in this particular instance it's the audience uh, he tries to identify the weaknesses and he's trying to make them worse <laughs> so uh, this is precisely how the disinformers operate they try to find the informational weakness which in some audiences might be the anti-migrant sentiment. In other audiences, it might be the anti-LGBT feelings. And in the case of United States, it has, it has been for decades the racial question. And they are trying to make it worse. So that's not to say that they have uh, kind of created the protest, not at all, no. But they, they are definitely happy to fuel it and they are definitely happy to abuse the, the emotions. But to be perfectly frank, I haven't seen a, a lot of kind of coordinated activity that we could attribute to the Russian state actors, to be completely clear. We can see that the Russian state media are kind of uh, mocking the US for the response. Uh, they are kind of happy to see that, that the US is in turmoil, but I wouldn't say that we see some, some massive uh, inauthentic operation um, Regarding the cooperation with the US, I, I, I would be only happy if we saw more of that. I, I do understand the, uh, yeah. the problems. I do understand uh, who is sitting in the White House. <laughs> I do understand that some people do not make it really easy, but I believe that there is a lot of goodwill in the, in the government. I, I know personally quite yeah. a few people in the State Department who want to work on this topic and who would love to cooperate with the European Union my experience rather is that it was it was rather on our side of the Atlantic where we were a little bit more reluctant to cooperate with the United States. So, so that was my experience, in fact. Um, I, I do think that democratic states should be working on this together. I think, for example, the uh, reaction to the case of Skripal has shown that a strong response coming from the democratic world can, can send a very strong message. And I think we should be using this much more often. We have had these cases in Europe, in, in, in Germany, the hacking of Bundestag or the murder of Hanko Schwili on the streets of Berlin, um, the hacking of the OPCW in, in the Netherlands. We, we see that the information aggressors are, are really using the same playbook in many countries. And I think we could be building some, some um, more 
more robust response of the democratic states, where where I do believe that the United States would be would be uh, would be willing to help. Thank you very much again, Jakub. Um, we have one last question for Patrick, and then we'll be wrapping up again. It's, it's too fast, but uh, one last question. So you're an expert also in cyber norms. What is normal behavior? And COVID nineteen was a uh, was a, was a catalyzing, was catalyzing that debate. What, is it normal to hack a hospital while in a big health crisis? And should we uh, not just persecute, prosecute these hackers uh, just for computer offenses, but also for death or manslaughter or uh, otherwise uh, titles? So how do we, uh, what norms are there uh, internationally for states to behave themselves in this in the disinformation, the information domain? That's a great question. So I think it's important really to understand that uh, in the international environment, we're not really operating in any legal or policy vacuum. There are instrument, legal instruments and policies already in place. And when you ask about norms, I think uh, the particularly useful one and then the, the one that has really picked up over the past uh, uh, weeks and months is uh, the processes within the United Nations. The United Nations has established what's called the group of governmental experts that for several years now uh, has been working on designing uh, norms of responsible behavior in cyberspace. And in 2015, it produced a report that asks the states to actually abstain from attacks against a critical infrastructure. And not only that, it also imposed the obligations of states to ensure that no such attacks are originating from the territory. So if you think about uh, COVID-19 and the potential impact that the disinformation campaigns have on human uh, lives, you could expect that the states will undertake this uh, due diligence principle and will assist countries that are being affected by those disinformation campaigns uh, in order to uh, prevent them. Now, this is, uh, as we hear, unfortunately not happening. So where does that leave us? Well, the problem with UN norms, uh, especially in this context of the group of governmental experts is that they are of non-binding nature. So states are uh, free to ignore those specific norms. Now, again, this is not to say that we operate in a legal vacuum. Uh, some of those norms overlap with clear provisions of international law that states have already adopted for many uh, international documents. I've already mentioned only one United uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but there are many more. So states are already legally obliged to comply with those um, uh, with those obligations. We have seen two weeks ago, Estonia has organized for the first time an ARIA formula hearing at the UN Security Council, which also focused on um, the COVID-19 and cyber attacks against healthcare, healthcare institutions. So I think we have, uh, we have quite a broad scope for uh, operations here. But we need to be, I think, a bit more creative in how we establish the link between, in the conversation with the, uh, about the disinformation, cyber attacks, and international politics and cyber diplomacy. That's something that has not really been happening uh, much. And I think we have to be uh, as creative as those who design those disinformation campaigns in, in designing our responses. We should not let those to really uh, limit us too much. Exactly. Thank you very much, Patrick, for that answer. And thank you all for participating. It's so frustrating that the time is already over. <laughs> it's just time is biting us. But I'd like to thank you very much. You're such prolific authors. You've been feeding this debate for many years, and now you're feeding the European Parliament and all the viewers. And I'd like to thank you. If I had a bottle of wine, I'd give it to you. <laughs> we'll make sure you get another wave. We'll, make, we'll, we'll express our gratitude in another way. So thank you very much for joining us. And um, with that, um, and as Maite has already introduced, I'd like to wrap up a couple of the discussions that we had today. And I hope I do it in an ordinary matter, Maite. And if I don't, you will be, be sure to uh, express your thoughts uh, after me, because I'll, I'll keep it short. So in the last two minutes, I'd like to say thank you, everybody, for being here today for Renew Europe. This is an important debate. This is not going away. This debate, um, it's about trust in our society, confidence, like uh, Mr. Reichstadt said, and some of the people, they were, Nathalie Loiseau's session. It's about trust in our society. Europe is one of the best places to live in the world. And we have confidence in ourselves, in our economies, in our democracies, and we should keep it that way.
I think uh, that that trust is undermined by uh, this information, uh, and that is something that we should look at. It has a democratic uh, risk. It has a foreign policy risk. It has internal policy risk. It has human rights uh, risks so like discrimination, racism, and it's a balancing act. Whatever we want to do about it, I think is a balancing. It's a balancing act between the freedom of expression versus uh, the non-interference versus etc. So if we want to do something about it, we have to cooperate with others to balance uh, with them. So we have to balance with platforms, not just the old platforms like Twitter and Facebook, but as, <laughs> as uh, Julianne uh, perfectly uh, expressed, it's also TikTok and Stitch. And those are the new platforms that we're looking at. And it's more imagery and less written. So how do we cope with that and that new technology? It's also about researchers we have to engage with, with media. We have to engage with NATO. OECD was mentioned today, very important. Civil society, teachers. Oh, we have a lot to do. We have so much work to do. And we haven't got that in place yet. And what is important right now for Renew Europe is to get that in place. So I'm writing a paper, and I believe Maite is very eager to, to, to write a paper. And we'll be... Uh, pushing this debate forward in the European Parliament so that Europe will be setting a next step because uh, we're not done. In the context of evolving uh, threats, evolving technology, uh, the potential of foreign states and others of <clears throat> spreading this information is only growing. And what I'd like to see is that we put, a, put an end to it. It will never end completely, but we have to be resilient and we have to do something about, about our adversaries who uh, can't seem to be stopping. So thank you very much for anyone uh, here today. And I'd like to express our gratitude to the staff who has actually done a terrific job in getting everyone here. It's been very prolific and I learned a lot. And if there's anything anyone wants to add, please do so now. And then I'll be wrapping up this uh, wonderful webinar. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll be seeing each other in another format. Thank you. Thank you.